Well, I'd like to start and, and welcome everyone here. Uh, on behalf of uh, Central Massachusetts Podiatry, uh, Dr. Feldman is here, Dr. Kellner, and Dr. Saviet. He's kind of here virtually. We're going to really take advantage of all this, this Zoom technology. And uh, we'd like to thank you all. We're going to be talking all about plantar fasciitis uh, today, and uh, we were going to record this, so you don't really have to take notes, and we'll send you guys a copy afterwards. Um, once again, I'll introduce kind of what we're going to be doing here. Dr. Feldman's going to be talking about the causes of plantar fasciitis and about shoes and orthotics. Uh, Dr. Kellner is going to talk about imaging and also surgical treatments. I'm going to be talking about non-surgical treatments. And then Dr. Saviet is going to talk about the regenerative medicine. And then we're going to have a time for questions. We received a few questions prior. And then certainly you can type in the chat box if you guys have any questions during the course. If we can address it in that section, we will. If not, we'll address it. Uh, at the at the end of the talk. We're hoping to last probably 40 minutes here and uh, barring, depending on how many questions we have. So once again, thanks for everyone. I'm gonna uh, first welcome uh, Dr. Feldman, uh, talk a little bit about the causes of plantar fasciitis. Thanks, Don. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, plantar fasciitis is one of my uh, favorite topics to discuss because it's uh, extremely common and we see a lot of patients with it. Um, you know, I've been in private practice for 20, gosh, 22 years now. And um, I've sort of gone through a, um, I don't know, I don't want to say a renaissance, but I've learned a lot over the years. And, um, you know, what I still see on Google searches and with people coming into the office with, with arch pain or heel pain or plantar fasciitis, um, you know, it's still sort of, um, a lot of people think it's an injury. And, um, and I, and they treat it as an injury, rest, ice, compression, you know, if something hurts, I should rest it, I shouldn't uh, aggravate it, I need to take a break, but it's really not an injury. And um, oftentimes it's not even a problem with the foot. It's, um, it's sort of what the body is doing to the foot. Repetitive movement, repetitive motions that lead to stress in the foot um, can cause pain. And just because something started hurting last week, last month, or six months ago, doesn't mean it was a problem the day before when it started to hurt, or it wasn't the specific single activity that you had done uh, to cause it to pain, it, it, to cause it to start to hurt. Um, it's really what you've been doing for many, many years. All right, Don, you want to move on? So first off, plantar fasciitis. Uh, itis is just inflammation. Um, the plantar fascia is... Um, a structure, it's called fascia, it's on the bottom of the foot. The bottom of the foot is called the plantar surface of the foot. So uh, the name of the structure is, um, it's just a fascia on the bottom of the foot. You've, if you've ever had a tension headache back of your neck, if you've ever had low back pain, you've had other types of fasciitis. Back of the neck would be nuchal fasciitis. Uh, lower back pain would be thoracolumbar fasciitis. Bottom of the foot is called plantar fasciitis. So it really is just a, um, um, a location and a problem in the location. I don't love the name plantar fasciitis. In fact, if I could go back in time and rename it, rename it I would call it um, tensionitis because to me, it's not an injury. It's not even so much a problem with inflammation. It's a problem with tension. Uh, we will use the word inflammation and we will describe inflammation and anti-inflammatories um, because when you do treat inflammation, you are treating tension to some extent but it's a lot easier to kind of keep everybody on the same page if I, if I just mentioned inflammation rather than tension. But you can see there's a bony attachment where, um, where the hand and the, the arrow are up in that top image. Um, the red signifies the area under chronic load or chronic tension, which can become inflamed. It can become thickened, uh, placed under a lot of load. Think about a rope that can only handle a certain amount of tension on that rope. And if you apply more tension than it's capable of handling, and think of a braided rope, over time those braids are gonna widen, they might start to separate. And that's what happens with the fascia. The fibers actually begin to separate and they because they can't handle the tension over time. And now you have a structure that is has lost its integrity and it's being asked to handle tension that's beyond what it can handle. And that's really what causes the pain. With fascia, all types of fascia, fascia by definition starts on bone on one, one side and then it extends into soft tissues on another. The structure under, under the microscope looks exactly like tendons and exactly like ligaments. A tendon, for instance, attaches 
a muscle on one end to bone. So if it's a bicep, you have the muscle here, it attaches to the, the bone on the other side of a joint. And its job is to move the joint in flexion for the bicep. And so muscles exert the will of a tendon at a given joint. So some muscles are movers, some muscles are, are stabilizers. A ligament starts on bone and attaches to bone. So they cross a joint, um, but there's no contraction and they stabilize a joint that's in movement. Fascia is sort of a secondary stabilizing structure. It's a tension band, so to speak. So it helps keep movement on track, on track, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't stretch and it doesn't relax. So it's just there to handle tension and load. All right. So I think we just discussed, is it really inflammation or is it really tension? Well, tension does become inflammation and in, a, in an acute setting. So you, you go for a long walk and the next day you can't even get out of bed in the morning because it, it hurts so bad. Yes, that is inflammation because that tension then reached that point where it really hurts with every step. Um, you don't necessarily have to stop moving unless you're limping or unless your, your foot is swollen. Um, if you can't walk normally, then I would say it's probably important to, to relax whatever activity that you're doing or definitely take a step back. Um, but a lot of times plantar fasciitis hurts with the first few steps out of bed in the morning or from sitting to standing, and then it actually loosens up and will feel better. A lot of runners will tell me that, you know, it takes a few minutes to get started, but once they're running, they're totally fine. It's after the run. And more specifically, it's after kind of relaxing from the run and then going to get up or the next morning is when it typically hurts. That's something that you actually don't have to stop moving. You have to get creative and, and sort of prepare for the activity that you're going to do and then uh, be proactive after the activity to prevent it from hurting. Um, I always love the, uh, I tried everything and nothing works. Um, because my feeling is you've tried everything that you've read on Google or what you your friends have uh -huh. told family or historically what's worked. So I've stretched, I've iced, I changed shoes. I went to the shoe store. I got a new pair of shoes. I got arch support. I've worn a night splint. I've taken medication. I've even got a cortisone shot and nothing works. Oh, I've been a PT. That doesn't help either. Um, you know, there, there's a lot more to plantar fasciitis than an injury. And that's just sort of injury thinking because injuries heal. Uh, you have an injury, you might rest it, you might do all those things, and then they heal and then you can move on. But when you've moved your way into a problem, you have to move your way out. You have to change the things that you've been doing that led to the pain if you want to get out of the pain. So trying everything goes beyond um, um, treating it like an injury. Where there's smoke, there's a fire. So what I mean by that is where you, where you see the smoke or where the, the problem first reveals itself, like in the bottom of the foot, there is an underlying cause to that smoke and it's not always in the foot. Oftentimes it's in the hips, it's in, in movement, um, but it's really important to do a comprehensive uh, history and, and physical, watch somebody walk and, and just sort of get a sense of where this is really coming from. Sometimes it's, you know, for runners, for runners it's training problems. Yes, it could be shoes, uh, but it's usually not just one thing. It's usually multiple factors um, that are involved with, uh, with leading to the symptoms that create plantar fasciitis. Um, so just kind of moving on to, uh, to shoes um, and inserts. One of the first things people do is they get a new pair of shoes. And I think, I think shoes are important, but I don't think they're necessary. And I don't think support is necessary. If we needed support, we would have been born with support. We're born with everything our bodies need uh, to provide a lifetime of, of uh, activity. Um, we can do everything we can do with shoes without shoes. Now, the problem occurs when we've worn shoes for 30, 40, 50 years, and at some point there's no going back, or if our bodies have adapted uh, or our feet have become weakened, then um, we certainly um, can't necessarily do everything barefoot. Plus, in today's society, it's not really um, socially acceptable to go barefoot all the time, though there are many that actually do that. I wouldn't say many, but there are people that I know, probably about five or six people that I have their books in my office and... Uh, and I've heard them talk and I've talked with them. Uh, they, they have functioned for decades uh, barefoot entirely. Um, but shoes to me um, can be very helpful, but they should be comfortable. A shoe should fit your foot. Um, a shoe should help you maintain better posture. And all things being equal, if you have two shoes that feel pretty good, choose the lighter shoe, because that's essentially what the foot is. The foot you know, is, is a perfect fit, if you're barefoot, it's going to help you maintain the posture that you're supposed to have. 
and the foot is as heavy as the foot is. When you start adding weight to the foot and the end of the leg, you're gonna add work to the hips and the muscles that, that carry us. It's gonna create fatigue. If you have an elevated heel, it's gonna throw off your posture. And if you have a poor fit, you're not gonna be able to use your toes. And your toes, while not fingers and not as dexterous as fingers, are very important to the function of a foot. Um, you have toes for a reason and they should be used. And if you scrunch them up in a shoe that doesn't fit properly, then you're only using a small part of your foot. And the fascia, which starts on the heel, doesn't extend to the tips of the toes. It actually extends to here. So when you ignore the toes, then your entire foot, all you're using is the fascia and you're not exposing it to the proper um, mechanical stress and strain that it's supposed to uh, undergo. So in my ideal world of shoes, I would have two types of shoes, one that's soft and one that's firm. And whatever people choose, you know, that's the one that they should go with. Um, you can see, um, sort of talking to my point, the ones in the left all taper and they have heels. The ones in the right uh, or in the middle, I should say the wide toe box, that's widest at the toes. And if anybody can tell me of a child's foot that's shaped like the one on the right or the three shoes on the left, uh, take a picture and send it to me because I have never seen a child's foot that's actually shaped like that. Every child's foot has five toes pointing forward, unless there is some underlying genetic deformity, which, which does happen from time to time. But the normal foot, foot structure is toe straight ahead, wider at the front of the foot, narrower at the heel. And why a hundred years ago, they started to make shoes that, that go against that, I, your guess is as good as mine. Plus the heels on shoes, especially in children that throw off posture because it, it shifts the hip position forward, which then puts an abnormal curve on the spine. It shortens our, um, our hip flexors and it lengthens our hamstrings, which completely uh, reorient the muscle tension and function, which uh, turn us from forefoot strikers to heel strikers, which ultimately um, will lead to things like plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, knee and low back problems. It's why so many people end up with knee and hip, hip replacements because we, by the time we have problems, by the time we realize there is a problem, it's too late and those joints are completely worn out. Um, next slide, just uh, more of the same. Um, I'm obviously a fan of the shoes on the left, uh, but that middle shoe is um, probably a, a New Balance. Um, I know Ben doesn't like when I mention name brands, but uh, that's a that's a pretty decent shape. That that third one over from the left, uh, the one on the right's getting a little bit too tapered, but but honestly, it's whatever's most comfortable. And not everybody has a wide foot. Some people have really narrow feet, and uh, if you do have foot deformities where the toes are a little bit. Um, pointed over and, and narrowed, then you can get away with, with some more traditional shoes that have tapered toe boxes. Um, and even the, the flat drop shoes or the lower drop shoes or the softer shoes aren't for everybody. But I guess the point is just go for comfort. Don't worry that you have to get something that's supportive or firm. Go with what's best. When you have plantar fasciitis, typically a bit of a heel actually feels more comfortable because it does put a little less tension on the fascia. It's not good for getting yourself better, but in the moment it will feel better. Um, orthotics, you know, again, when, <laughs> when I started practicing, I, I thought I was doing so much good by getting people into orthotics and, and supporting a foot. And I do use a lot of orthotics and they can be extremely valuable devices, but I just don't think about it as supporting a foot. I don't, I don't want to take away from the strength of a foot because you need to develop strength in your foot and your arch, uh, so that your foot will last you a lifetime. I think of of orthotics is really postural alignment tools. Um, I, if I see a heel that's not in alignment with the body, then when one leg comes off the ground, the, the foot, the knee, the hip, everything is gonna drive inward. And if that's the case, an orthotic can help realign and rebalance the heel to the leg uh, and give you a stable um, uh, leg to stand on so that when, it, if it, for instance, your left heel is misaligned with the with the left leg, when your right leg comes off the ground, everything's gonna tip in. So an orthotic can reposition that heel to keep everything well in line so that when the right leg comes off the ground, the left leg stays stable. A lot of times with, when I sense if somebody needs an orthotic, that's what I'm, I'm trying to determine. 
Um, the other thing is, I'll ask somebody, you know, are you more comfortable barefoot? Is, is being barefoot the most comfortable that you are? If you could live life barefoot, would you? And if the answer is yes, then I'm going to steer clear of orthotics for as long as possible, because I think a lot of people try try different shoes and, and different styles of shoes, and they just go after that shoe route and the insert route, and it's just more, 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 when really what they lead, need is less, less, less. Um, now, the difference between hard and soft orthotics um, is, a, is a question I get a lot because a lot of people say, oh, I hate the orthotics because they're really hard. Now, it's more about heel position than it is about arch height. I don't care about supporting an arch. I care about positioning the heel. So if you have not corrected heel position, then your arch is going to collapse into something very firm and it's probably going to be uncomfortable. Um, you need material that's firm because it needs to support a body in movement. So it has to be firm enough. You could add cushion to it, but if it's made properly, then it does need to be hard. They're made with materials these days that are really high, um, 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 highly efficient materials that hold on to elasticity and they last a long time. Uh, they're made very, very lightweight and made thinner and thinner. So an orthotic should not be very thick shouldn't take up more room in the shoe than, than does the uh, sock liner from the shoe. And it typically replaces that. Dress shoe orthotics, I'm not a huge fan of because um, you can't put a heel um, into, a, uh, into a heeled shoe. Um, there is a role sometimes for those and those tend to be a little bit softer. But I, I really, I care mostly about function uh, and the comfort should be more for the shoe. And if something is very functional, then ultimately it will be comfortable. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Feldman. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Kellner is going to talk a little bit about uh, imaging. Once again, if you have any questions, put them in the chat bot box below. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. And really well said, Dr. Feldman. Thank you for that. It's always a great thing to listen to uh, hear you talk about <laughs> posture and control. Um, so anyway, uh, some of the diagnostic exams, looking at the imaging, um, the three pictures here are, are, are different um, imaging modalities. On, on the left is the x-ray machine actually at our Westboro office. Uh, the middle picture is an ultrasound machine, again, at our Westboro office. And then on the right is an MRI machine, um, which we do not, not at have. our Westboro office. <laughs> I don't know of any other private office that has that. Um, so we can go next slide. So um, pretty much any patient coming in will get a basic set of um, x-rays um, as this not only just shows uh, what heel spurs can look like and um, also gives us a good image of <clears throat> um, what your biomechanics are structurally for your foot and how we can relate this to the ongoing condition. Um, but first off, I will point out the, the heel spurs there and we can see, um, you know, we, we always think we have heel spurs and that's the source of the problem. Um, I, I won't get in, into it too much, but the, the spurs just indicate how much tension has been there for a long period of time. Um, we have our Achilles tendon that comes on the back of the heel, and we can see how it is uh, continuous um, with the plantar aspect of the heel bone where the plantar fascia starts and where there's a, a spur there. So that person, I already know that they, that tension, this plantar fasciitis has been coming on for some time now. Um, and, and this is not a, a flat foot lecture, but we can see the difference in the, in the biomechanics from the left picture, which is a younger patient, which our biomechanics are, are very stabilized. And we can see how, you know, on the right hand, where it's a more progressive deformity. And this is kind of what um, mild to moderate level of what arch collapse can look like. Um, those lines essentially should be parallel. And you can see how the offset is, is what the arch collapse actually um, is and and how that can elongate the foot and, and add even further tension to um, the plantar fascia. Um, so if there is any kind of focal issue or you want to fully further evaluate the plantar fascia at its, at its origin, this is um, what an ultrasound image looks like. On the, on the top is a, a more normal appearing ultrasound. The bottom is, is more pathologic. Um, so what ultrasound is, is just sending um, sound waves um, down from the, the skin layer and the sound waves bounce back from whatever is most dense. So if at the top of the image, it would be where the skin level is. And um, that, that sharp white line that it's bouncing off of would be the bottom of the heel bone. And so just above that heel bone there, you can kind of see little crosshairs that are measuring the um, plantar fascia itself. So this would be 
Um, this is actually my own fascia. I took an image for, for this lecture um, and, and found out there's a mild level of thickening. I measured three millimeters on, on that, on my own fascia, um, but it's very thin. There's not much um, dark space in, within the fascia compared to the um, lower image where there's lots of black areas. So the black areas are, are likely um, infl inflammation, inflammatory fluid. So there is a, dis a disease process ongoing um, within the fascia. And so that, you know, it's more pathologic for that. <clears throat> um, and finally, there's uh, an MRI might be ordered. Um, I, I, I feel that with ultrasound in our office, um, we have significantly reduce the amount of MRIs that need to be ordered, which is much more cost effective for the patient and healthcare in general. Um, however, I, I would consider an MRI if I want to rule out any other conditions, such as like a stress fracture of the heel bone, um, or if you've gone the extent of, you know, really trying everything that there is to offer and, and surgery is um, being considered, um, an MRI is often ordered for pre-operative planning. So on the left side, you can see what a normal thin plantar fascia may look like. And on the right side, it's, this, it's the, that dark line and, and on the right picture, how it's very um, thickened right at the origin. <clears throat> okay, anything? Okay, thank you, Dr. Kellner. Uh, I, uh, I, I love the, the ultrasound now that we have that we were able to really show and what works really well is we show, for example, if you have it on the right foot, we'll do the right and the left and you can compare and you can definitely see the, the changes and sometimes even the improvement. I'm gonna go over some of the, the non-surgical, but before I, I just want to emphasize uh, what Dr. Feldman said in the beginning. I have patients come in and they always say, they say, you know, doc, what's the, what's the one shoe that'll get rid of my heel pain? Or what's the one pill that I need to get rid of my heel pain? Really, it's, it's kind of a, a combination of, of treatments and usually the things that people try first I'm going to go over some of them right here, but do I find that these things resolve someone's plantar fasciitis if they've had it for six months or a year? Rarely. And, and, I, and I learned this uh, analogy from Dr. Feldman, but it's kind of like pieces of a puzzle. And I'm not sure what pieces you're going to need to put together to resolve your plantar fasciitis. Some patients, if it's very mild and they come in, they're going to start with some anti-inflammatories. And once again, if your doctor will allow you to do that, I usually recommend trying it twice a day. I like a, a leave or an aproxen because it's twice a day dosing. I find with ibuprofen or, or something like that, or, or a leave, it's gonna, or um, Advil, it's gonna, you're gonna forget the, the middle dose. So I find um, a leave works better for that. Try it for two weeks. If, you, if you're not finding improvement uh, to reduce inflammation, after two weeks, I would stop it. I don't like people to be on it long-term. Are there some uh, natural ways to reduce it, like turmeric and some other anti-inflammatory type of foods? You can certainly try that. Do I ever find people get rid of their plantar fasciitis with that? Not usually. Uh, I think icing or contrast baths are, are both very beneficial. Uh, to start, if, you're, if you are having pain, you can take a, a Dixie cup and kind of tear off the sides and you can ice it. I recommend 10 minutes twice a day. You can also ice it with a bottle of water. These are the things that you find in the internet uh, that you could try. Most people try these things before they come and see us. Uh, I also like uh, doing contrast baths. You do five minutes in ice water, five minutes in hot water, and then five minutes in ice water. And I kind of equate that to rebooting your computer at home. Sometimes by re, uh, kind of doing that contrast, it can help uh, reduce the inflammation in the area. This is kind of a unique method as well of doing some stretching while you're icing it. These are things that you can try before you come and see someone. You may have already tried it. Uh, once again, if you've, if you've been having this for months and months, do I think just icing by itself is going to be enough? Probably not. Anti-inflammatories, probably not. You're going to need more. Uh, tightness, as Dr. Feldman said, uh, tightness or I guess overall posture, movement, all that's very important. Things that you can try before and, and even uh, coming in would be reducing the, the adhesions or tightness or helping the mobility of the back of the calf and then everything above, uh, such as any core weaknesses. It's hard to do that on your own without physical therapy, but we're big believers in physical therapy. There are some tools that we find that help patients. Uh, a lot of times patients stretch incorrectly. That's why deep tissue massage works a little bit better. 10 minutes twice a day is what I recommend for patients. There's a deep tissue ball, very similar to kind of this ball, but it's a little bit different size. You don't need to block with it. 
getting in there, there's a foam roller, and then there are sticks. There's a lot of different methods that you can use to reduce the tightness. These are, these are beneficial. Also something very simple. If you have that morning pain that, that Dr. Um, Dr. Feldman talked about getting out of bed in the morning, we, I'll put uh, under this, this video, I'll send it out afterwards. There's a, a video we did on, on how to help that first morning pain. It's kind of some belly breathing, uh, how to get up uh, with your first step, putting on uh, some sandals, like UFO sandals, just, and then doing some deep tissue massage, either with your hand or some of these tools to help with that first step out of bed pain. There are some resources and we'll, we'll, we'll send that out afterwards after this webinar, I'll put it on the bottom of this video. But reducing the tightness is very, very important. Uh, to reduce, to help reduce the pain. One of those things you can try before you come in. Don't just stretch. Don't just do the runner stretch, push, pushing off the wall and be, be especially careful doing that, that stretch where you kind of drop it down on a stair where you drop all the way down. Uh, you don't want to cause any injury with that. There are, uh, there is a re recommended like a towel stretch or if you have a band before you get into bed, that can be helpful foam rolling as well as helpful. I don't know if you want to sleep with a foam roller in the bed though. Uh, so a towel, leave a towel there, stretch it for two or three minutes before you get out, massage the calf, and then put on some type of a, a sandal or something with a good arch support. I don't particularly like this. This is I'm just putting this here for completion. This, I don't prescribe this, but patients have tried this. It's called a Strasburg sock. I find for a lot of people it causes numbness to the toes and because it pulls them back so much. This is used to try to stretch things. And uh, the same thing with the night splint. I don't find these all that beneficial. But uh, patients can, if they if they have morning pain, this as well as this or foam rolling, these things can can be helpful for people. Once again, though, it's much more beneficial to do a course of physical therapy uh, in conjunction with those things. This is just an example of some over the counter inserts. Uh, what what Dr. Feldman talked about. You want something that has a deep heel cup so you can help stabilize the heel as much as possible. These aren't going to do any real correction to the heel like an, a custom orthotic uh, device would. Uh, this is the one that I recommend for people starting out. The main thing you want to realize is when you push down the arch, it shouldn't flatten out. It, it should have some type of um, stiffness to it. And this can fit into any type of a shoe. This is probably one that Dr. Feldman wouldn't recommend, this brand. Uh, it has a tapered toe box, but this is the, the picture that I use. And then uh, some people do some taping. We don't do much in the office. Sometimes physical therapy will do some taping uh, on the bottom of the foot to help uh, stabilize your foot. Now, this is something that we all recommend, and, and I, I just tell people, everyone asks, do I really need to go to physical therapy? I think that people get better faster when they go to physical therapy, and I also say that your physical therapist probably won't just look at your foot or your calf. They're probably going to look at everything above it, so usually looking at your hip mobility, looking at your core stability, looking at other things that are going to cause it, because everything starts higher up and moves its way down. We, like, like Dr. Feldman, just that one example he gave, if you're, if you're flattening and you are in a single leg stance, everything is gonna kind of move inward. So working with the strengthening of those hip flexors and, and other areas within your body to help with posture is gonna make everything better. You have to think you've been walking and moving the, the wrong way for years. Now you're seeing the, the, the problems with it. So it's going to take some time. You have to be patient with the, with the physical therapy. This is specifically a technique called the, the Graston technique, where they rub a hard piece of metal down the back of the calf uh, to loosen any adhesions that are in there. Uh, also for some patients, uh, I, uh, patients that are in a lot of pain, let's say you're just limping, you can't do anything. Sometimes I'll put them in a walking boot uh, I don't do it a lot for plantar fasciitis because I like to keep people more mobile. There is a, a brace that I've been using more re recently. It's called a velocity brace. Basically, it almost has an, an orthotic built in and it allows your foot to move up and down and it doesn't allow the side to side movement. And what I like about it is it puts the pressure in the, on the lower leg. So it reduces some of the, the tension going through the fascia. That's how, I, that's how it works. And this is a compression stocking. Some people like to try compression stockings as well. Uh, where, where is there a place for cortisone? Uh, we, you know, we have a lot of these regenerative treatments, which Dr. Saviot's going to talk about next. But uh, before we had those, we did a lot of cortisone. I know Dr. Feldman does a lot, uh, probably still. We still do them. We're doing less because of the regenerative, where we want your body to heal itself. The way I kind of use cortisone is if someone has a pain of an eight, nine, or a 10, or they're limping, they can't put their foot down. Or, you know, that's when I will do a cortisone. I like to do it now with ultrasound guidance. So I'll use an ultrasound to look exactly where it is, where I can see the thickness and I can put it right in the area 
of the, the black, right, where the, the swelling or inflammation is around it. And you can use less of the cortisone. Um, we don't do cortisone, for example, like in the knee, where they do that every three months for arthritis. It, it, we tend not to do more than two or three. And uh, I, I don't remember the last time I've, I've done that many. Uh, but you, you kind of put it, some people have pain right in the bottom, we'll go in a different approach. Uh, and then we try to, once again, this is an example with an amnio injection, kind of showing where the where the, the black is and then where the black disappears. That's the whole goal. The whole goal is to reduce the inflammation. Cortisone can reduce inflammation, but it doesn't really bring healing. And those are some of the more of the regenerative treatments that help to bring the healing. And that's what Dr. Uh, Saviot's going to talk about next year. So he couldn't uh, join us. We recorded a nice little video of him uh, doing this. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Saviot. Sorry, I couldn't be live in person for the meeting today. My section of this discussion on plantar fasciitis treatments is on regenerative medicine, which as a category is sort of the, the idea of using advanced technologies to get your tissues to repair rather than trying to calm down inflammatory processes. Sometimes what we do does calm down inflammatory processes. If you were to Google the or to wiki search what regenerative medicine is, it's the process of replacing engineering or regenerating human or animal cells or organs to restore or establish normal function. And everything that we're going to talk about in this discussion is involved in getting your tissues to repair and kind of undo the damage that you're that you've done to yourself or has been done to you to get it to heal faster. Um, one of the first things, and I'll I'll be going in order of sort of how much it costs. These go from decreasing the least amount of cost to the most expensive cost. Um, shockwave therapy is one of my favorite modalities. There's a ton of research that supports it um, in the medical literature, in case reviews, but also in uh, randomized controlled studies comparing its success rate to other things. Uh, my favorite thing to tell folks about with shockwave therapy is there's a there's no indication, there's no studies that show that cortisone injections solve the problem for you. And under most circumstances, after 30 days uh, for a cortisone injection for plantar fasciitis, you're no better. And that's based on a meta-analysis, which combines multiple studies into one. Um, however, there are multiple randomized controlled studies that show people who got shockwave therapy versus a sham therapy got much, much better with shockwave therapy, um, certainly compared to the sham therapy, but also compared to cortisone injections in a few studies. So it's very well supported in the literature. Effectively, what it is, is if we're using the radial shockwave device, which is the one here on the right, um, it's a, a little handheld jackhammer. And what it does is it creates a high pressure wave followed by a low pressure wave. It kind of compresses your tissues. Um, with all of these, what we're doing is we're, we're creating a force that your tissues are then going to respond to. Evolutionarily, if I hit you with a rock, it's advantageous for your body to go, oh my God, I've been hit by something that's going to cause an injury. We need to go respond to it and fix it right now. Um, and that's effectively what we're doing. We're kind of tricking your body into thinking that an acute injury has occurred and we need it to go heal that. Um, whether we do that with the radial shockwave machine, which creates a pulse that goes through and kind of separates through your tissues, or we do it with the focus shockwave machine, which starts from outwards and really focuses inwards, um, they're both creating the same effect. It's a mechanical force applied to your tissue that stimulates a biologic response, and that's called mechanotransduction. Um, they're both the two varieties, the focus shockwave versus the radial shockwave are good for different things. Um, I tend to find that the radial shockwave is very good for treating plantar fasciitis and a few of those other things. Um, the focus shockwave is a little more expensive than the radial shockwave just because it's a more sophisticated technology and a more expensive machine, um, but they both have exceptional, really, really good results. Sometimes with the focus shockwave, we can do less treatments. Um, than we have to with the radial shockwave machine, but they're both very good for treating plantar fasciitis. Um, for some folks, in terms of when to consider it, it really depends. If you have been hurting for a long, long time and haven't gotten better with other things, then I might recommend shockwave the first time I see you. There are other folks, my high level athletes in particular, whenever I treat one of the local college kids, I tend to jump to shockwave very quickly because it gets people to heal a lot faster. Uh, it does reduce your pain right away. 
but that tends to be a temporary effect. The real long-term lasting effect, because we're getting your cells to respond to it, takes about four weeks for it to really kick in. So with my high level athletes, I try to have them not lose any time in training. So I, I will tend to shockwave my higher level athletes sooner rather than later. And then for other folks, I will sometimes have them try a bunch of stuff that they haven't tried before. And then we see if they need shockwave later to kind of give it a kick and get it moving a little faster. My, own, my only real problem with it is it's a little bit operator dependent. It is a little bit uncomfortable to get shockwave done to you. Um, I always tell my patients, I'm a giant sissy, but I can shockwave myself. So I find that it's not unbearable. It's just a little uncomfortable. Um, but there are some doctors or nurses or whoever may be applying the shockwave, to, shockwave therapy to you. Um, you do have to be a little bit uncomfortable. So if the person providing the treatment is not willing to kind of coach you through it or not be sort of tough enough on you to help you get through it, um, then you're not going to have as big of a response. And with shockwave, I tend to use regenerative medicine as like a, a lawn care analogy. Shockwave is like me coming to your yard where you have a, a patch of dead lawn and I'm going to aerate it. I'm going to water it perfectly. I'm going to make sure it gets extra sunlight because the, the overall health of your lawn should take care of it and fill in that damaged patch of lawn. Now, the next thing sort of up the cascade in terms of both cost predominantly, but sometimes effectiveness is platelet-rich plasma therapy. Um, what that is, is we draw a little bit of your blood, we spin it down, and then we re-inject it into you. Um, if you have all of the right stuff, and by that I mean you have the, the right cells in your body to heal this injury, sometimes platelet-rich plasma therapy, or PRP as it's called a lot and on the internet and on the sports radio conversations, um, is great. If you are an older person with less good cellular material to work with, it is a little bit harder for this to do its job. Um, when should you consider it? It, it definitely depends. Um, it is more expensive than shockwave therapy, um, but it is very effective in the right hands and with the right patients. Um, my problems with platelet-rich plasma therapy is, well, it involves me giving you a, a blood draw um, or one of our medical assistants who used to be a phlebotomist doing the blood draw. Um, it's even more operator dependent. So if we don't get a good blood draw, if we don't inject it into the right spot, if we don't know exactly where you're hurting or you have a complicated injury, uh, it's also very patient dependent. So if you're a, a healthy person, then you have more good stuff for us to work with, then the likelihood of us injecting the good stuff is better. Um, but if you're a person who's had chemotherapy or well, you're in your in your 70s or 80s, the likelihood of you having the right cellular material for us to re-inject is a lot lower. Another problem with it is the medical literature, the scientific literature on it is very mixed. Um, I think that has a lot to do with the operator dependency, the patient dependency, um, and the last part is inaccurate injections. I think that makes the literature unclear. So a lot of doctors will do this without any kind of direct visualization with where they're injecting it. Um, if we ever do this in our office, we do it under ultrasound guidance. So we find the most damaged tissue and we inject right into that tissue that needs it the most. Um, in terms of the lawn care analogy I use for regenerative medicine, this is sort of like taking uh, having that dead patch in your lawn and you're going to go dig up a patch of really nice looking grass um, that you're pretty sure is really, really healthy grass and you kind of dig down, you scoop out that little patch and you're going to graft it into an area that could use it, could use it more. Um, oftentimes we will do this with shockwave therapy to try to hedge our bets in a way and make sure that what we've injected into there is really going to take a lot better. So this is transplanting a patch of grass into your lawn, aerating it, making sure it gets all the right sunlight and watering and everything, everything along those lines. One of the last things in that regenerative medicine space is something called amniotic tissue graft injections. Um, what it is, is a, a group of preserved placental tissue. So they take that layer from, um, from live C-section births and they preserve it and turn it into a, an injectable form. Um, how it works is we're taking all of the right stuff. There's some really sophisticated medicine at work here in terms of the cellular material that is in that placenta 
but we're basically taking that material that we know is great for tissue healing and we're injecting it into your diseased tissue or damaged tissue to try to give it some rocket fuel for healing. Um, when should you consider it? it? Again, it depends. If you're someone who's been dealing with an injury for a long time and it hasn't responded to standard of care, if it doesn't respond to shockwave, or if you just have a big pile of money that you want to spend um, and throw everything at it all at once, the amniotic tissue is, is very helpful. It is the, the rocket fuel for healing, the way I describe it to folks. Um, my problem with it is the same as PRP. Um, it's very operator dependent. So if you don't put it in the right spot, uh, or you don't mix it up the right way, you don't inject it into the right place, then you may not have as much success with it. Even if it is the best stuff in the world, if you don't put it in the injured tissue, it's not gonna really respond. And then in terms of the, the medical literature for this, it is mixed, but a little bit less so than PRP. It's a slightly better um, injectable, so you do get a slightly bigger response, which can make up for some of the inaccuracy of the injections. But there's still no, no one's ever done a study where they do an ultrasound guided injection for all of this stuff, because ultrasound is hard and a lot of docs don't wanna learn how to do it. Um, the lawn care analogy I use for amniotic tissue graft injections is we, it would be like going to Gillette Stadium and stealing a patch of that beautiful sod right off of their field that, you know, right at the 50 yard line, that's going to have all the perfect root system. It's perfectly manicured. Every blade of grass is perfect. And then we're going to prepare that area in your lawn and stick it right down in there and expect that it's going to fix that damaged piece of tissue in your lawn. So as much as I love all these regenerative medicine techniques, they tend to be a little on the expensive side, but for folks who have tried other things and are not getting improvement the way that they want, they are very, very helpful. Um, and they definitely can expedite and really advance your healing process. And that's gonna be it for me. Good. I just exit out of this here. I think that was a good uh, explanation uh, for everyone here. And uh, we're gonna finish up here before we ask any questions or answer the questions we had uh, with the surgical treatment by Dr. Kellner. So I'll have you kind of go in here, Dr. Kellner. Yeah. Um, so again, yeah, if everything else has been tried and you're looking at surgery as you know, your, your, your last resort, last hurrah, um, there are a number of options. So it, it's good to consult with someone who's experienced in a number uh, of techniques and, and variety of options and able to present those to you and, and figure out which one is best for you instead of just a simple single approach but um so looking at the left picture here um that this is called an endoscopic plantar fasciotomy um the endoscopic part is that there is a um a portal introduced to the skin with a camera um, so it's a very two small little poke hole type incisions on both either side of the heel. Um, and you can see that metal tube going underneath the fascia, which is underneath the skin of the heel. <clears throat> um, and a camera is introduced through one side and a little blade is comes through to the other. And you can see where they kind of just cut through the, what's actually the inner portion, which tends to be the more uh, affected area of, of the plantar fascia. Um, it is important to only release either the middle one third and sometimes a little bit of the central band of the fascia as well. Um, it's important that you don't release the entire fascia because that can create other uh, instability issues because the fascia is there for a reason. If you lacerate the whole thing, that can cause other problems. <clears throat> um, so if I, I would use that um, fasciotomy with the, with the camera for mild to moderately thickened fascia um, without any type of um, nerve entrapment or other type of procedure. Um, for any severely um, thickened plantar fascias and, and often with a, a nerve entrapment, which can occur um, as the fascia, fascia gets very thick, it can cause pressure on, the, on um, certain nerves in the area and cause other <clears throat> neuritis type pains. Um, for those cases, I sometimes do recommend just doing it open, which is, is a bigger incision. Um, so you can actually visualize the plantar fascia and um, taking a, usually about a half centimeter to a centimeter wedge of the plantar fascia so that you're definitively removing all that very thick and degenerated tissue um, and also allowing more room for um, any nerve if there is an entrapment um, case going on as well. 
Um, you know, next slide, um, there are uh, newer advanced techniques. Um, this one is called the Topaz procedure. It's again, another a minimally invasive um, type procedure. Uh, as you can see, they're, they're drawing a grid-like um, <clears throat> pattern on, on the bottom of the heel. That's the area of the uh, affected plantar fascia. Um, a small <clears throat> uh, wand is actually introduced through each little hole, which is making it like a little poke hole. Um, and it introduces this low heat energy and radio frequency cablation is what it's called. Um, it's, it's a low heat, um, which actually just stimulates uh, an inflammatory response. It actually almost falls into that regenerative medicine category. This one is a little bit more invasive, so it's done in an operating room setting. Um, good side here is there is minimal downtime, usually one to two weeks in a walking boot and expectation of recovery in, in, in about six weeks typically, but surgery always has its inherent issues or complications potentially, so that can vary. <clears throat> um, and then the next procedure is called a 10x procedure, which is somewhat similar to that topaz procedure in a way, just a, just a different <clears throat> um, instrumentation and, and technology. Um, it's an ultrasonic debrider um, where there's high frequency vibrations that come through basically a, a needle point, which is introduced into the plantar fascia. And this is done under uh, ultrasonic guidance. Um, the neat thing about this um, procedure, it, it's very selective to what it debrides and removes. It will only remove unhealthy tissue. And if you put it up against healthy tissue, it actually will leave it fully intact and, and unharmed. So that's pretty uh, amazing how it can do that. Um, it's overall fairly quick procedure, but again, just given that it's with, with the ultrasound and, and the equipment and wanting to be in a sterile environment and removing the tissue, it's done in the operating room. Um, <clears throat> again, it's similar with the uh, recovery period of, of, of the topaz and, and really the other procedures uh, one to two weeks in a, in the walking boot. That's, that's my typical protocol. And then estimate six weeks to recovery and return to activity, giving you a good result. Good. Uh, I'm going to stop this, uh, sharing it so we can see everyone. And I'm going to start with some of the questions here. Um, one of the questions I want to start with asking Dr. Feldman, uh, thank you, Dr. Kellner, and it, this has been great. A lot of content here, uh, and I don't want to rush to go too late here. Uh, Dr. Feldman, why can it take so long to get better? Don't we get this from our patients and a lot of people that are here who had that question? Why does it take me so long when I got someone else got better fast, and why is it taking them so long? Yeah, like I alluded to earlier, it's just because you hurt on a Tuesday doesn't mean it started on a Monday. The, the causes of plantar fasciitis oftentimes will start um, 10, 20, 30, 40 years earlier with bad movement habits. If your movement's a little bit asymmetric, if your movement's a little bit off and strain and load are shifted towards one foot or one heel, uh, it's gonna start the process of that fascia thickening that you saw in the ultrasound that, that Sam showed uh, or Don showed. It's, um, it's one of those things where there comes a point in time where you just, you reach that point where you feel it. And it might be that one thing you did, which tipped the scales and then all of a sudden you felt it, but it wasn't that one thing that caused it. And depending on how many different underlying processes led to this problem and how long it took to develop it, it might take a long time to, to get better. And, you know, and usually patients have tried a bunch of things before they came in. So one of the first things I say is, look, what have you done? And they'll give me a whole list of things that they've done. And I said, okay, well, we can agree that that hasn't worked. Okay, so let's take all that and let's put it over here. And some of the stuff might not be bad, but we need to change the things that they've been doing. And, and some, some people, if, if it's just the first step out of bed in the morning type of pain, that's really not that difficult. You'll send out that video in the morning routine. There's a lot of ways, just foam rolling and uh, kind of preparing for that first step oftentimes will will take care of a lot of people's pain because most people don't foam roll, they just stretch. Um, but it becomes a little bit more complicated when something's been going on three months, four months, eight months, and they've tried a whole lot of things. And if the fascia is really thickened, it might not be able to handle uh, very much strain at all. So sometimes it just takes time for that fascia to start to heal itself and start to become a little bit more resilient. Uh, we do try to reduce tension 
to the heel, but at the same time, we try to increase resiliency of that heel to handle more tension. And that takes time. Uh, just like it takes time to get fit, just like it takes time to get stronger, uh, just like it takes time to have changes actually incorporated into everyday life. You also have to understand what habits you have of everyday life. If uh, if how you live your life, if you're on your feet for 12 hours a day and, and you're standing and you're standing with bad posture, well, good luck. It's, it's going to take a real long time to get better if it does at all. And sometimes symptoms come and go. So you might have really bad symptoms and they might disappear. Um, sometimes people get lucky with one shot and then eight years later it comes back on the other foot. Um, have you really fixed something? No, you just didn't have symptoms. So we recognize that symptoms are what bring people into the office, but the problems that led to those symptoms are much more complicated. Some are quick fixes and some are not. Um, but it really depends on recognizing what those are and being able to make the changes, you know, whether we can recognize it or whether the patient can actually make the changes. It's uh, that's the tough part, but it's not always a quick fix. And, and, um, and sometimes it's a lot of effort. Sometimes it's a lot of uh, different uh, attempts at trying different things to get people better, uh, but consistency more than anything else. Yeah, to, to go on, on on that, there was another question that they sent, sent in before. I've had plantar fasciitis twice in one foot and once in the other foot. Uh, what activities or workouts should I avoid? And what's the best way to keep it from, from attorney? I guess they're wondering what activities shouldn't they do so it won't come back? Yeah, well, the things that hurt probably should be avoided uh, or how they're doing those activities. You know, for um, people that have arthritis in the big toe joint, um, which I don't know if we've done a webinar on that yet, but at some point we probably will. Um, you know, for, for people that their, their big toes don't bend or their ankles don't bend, going into like lunging positions is, is bad. You know, people oftentimes will have plantar fasciitis and they like to do CrossFit, they like to do box jumps and other plyometric activity, yet their ankles don't bend and their hips don't bend, but they really like to do that because it makes them feel good. Um, so I would ask the question, well, why do you want to do a box jump? Like, what is so special about a box jump? Is it, you know, risk reward is what's the reward for being able to complete a box jump? Well, it mentally makes you feel good, but it exposes your back, hips, ankles, knees, and feet to an awful lot of potential damage and injury, especially, especially explosive moves like that. Um, so some people want to do things because they like working out in group classes and um, they like doing all that stuff because it makes you, it makes you feel good. It's, it's really fun. But, you know, you have to work at being able to do those things. So those are the people I would send to physical therapy and say, look, you, it's not like you can't ever do that again, but you have to earn the right to do that by moving better. And you have to understand what movements you're capable of and what movements you're not capable of. Um, you know, if, if I'm going to use a car analogy too, if I'm a Toyota Corolla, I can't race a Ferrari and expect to win. I'm just not designed like that. You know, if I'm 60, I'm not going to be able to work out with 20 year olds. You know, even if, you know, we move similarly, I'm 60, they're 20, they're just going to be able to do things without having symptoms right after where I'm not going to be able to reach down and tie my shoes without having symptoms. So it's just, it's different. Um, so you have to recognize sort of where you're at in life and you have to make adjustments and you have to be patient. You really have to understand like what your body allows and what it gives and not try to be something you're not, not try to force your body through something that it can't do because having pain in your body is a clear indication that something is wrong. Something is off. You're doing something that's that's hurting you. So if you really want to do that, you got to earn it yeah. and you got to do things, be as active as you can possibly be, but not at the things that are hurting you. And, and then there was a question here. Um, why does it last so long? And what can I do to quicken the recovery, especially if I can't stay off my feet? Like I got to work eight hours a day. I'm on my, I'm a nurse. We get a lot of that. I'm on my feet. How can I quicken it? We talked about it, I think, but yeah. anything specific? You know, the, the walking boot, I think if it's really acute is a good one. Cortisone can be helpful. Anti-inflammatories, um, you know, resting, you know, being able to take some breaks during the day, you know, foam rolling, icing, you know, you just, you, sometimes you got to get creative and sometimes you just being on your shift uh, as a nurse for 12 hours or, or more standing on it. Sometimes you just got to not do that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll deal with the last one. It says, in general, what are the newest treatments? We, we approach that. What we do in the office are really, there's nothing newer than what we have with the amnio, with the PRP, with especially the shockwave, both, both devices. 
that's what's that's what's new. I, is there anything else newer that you know that you guys know of? I think we have it. That's about it. Um, and then historically, what's been the most successful? I think historically it's been the combination of therapy uh, and the cortisone. Historically, before we had these new things, was really really effective, but short term, and we see people coming back. Anything else that historically worked, or any new treatments you know, Dr. Feldman? Before we finish up. Not even so much treatments, but I think proper diagnosis, proper understanding yeah. of the causes of it, and then committed and consistent patient responses. It's not like, what can I do for you? It's like, it's literally, what can you do to help yourself? I'm your guide. You know, yeah, we can do things like shots. We can provide orthotics. We can provide suggestions on maybe shoes and refer to physical therapy, but it's the little things at home. It's, you know, I can't be you know, with you before getting out of bed, so, you know, no, before you take that step, you got a foam roll or when you get home from work, you know, you just, you know, plop down on the couch, you know, that would be a good time to maybe ice and relax maybe foam roll a little bit. You know, it's, it's the little things and just being consistent with the little things is the best way through this. And, and you can move your way through this. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, we want to thank everyone. Uh, there was really no questions asked here. If anyone, you can open your mic, ask. If not, we'll, we'll finish up here. Okay. Well, well thank you. Thank you, everyone, thank you. for joining. Thank you, Dr. Feldman, Dr. Kellner, and everyone that's here. Have thank a good you. night.